Okay, we're back. This is Dave Vellante. I'm here with my co-host today, Stu Miniman. We're here live at Gillette Stadium at the VTUG Winter Warmer. The VTUG, the, the V-Mugs are local meetups where people get together. They talk about things like virtualization and cloud and just a bunch of peers getting together, a bunch of IT practitioners really sharing and, uh, and it's a good event. Brad Maltz is here. He is at the CTO's office of Luminate, uh, a CTO, a lifetime CTO. Brad, welcome. Good Thank to see you again. Thank you for having Appreciate me. Appreciate you coming on. Um, this is a good event. It's always been a good event for you guys. Uh, just for a little history, you were the CTO of ICI. Correct. Uh, right around the corner from Wikibon. Yep. You know, the <laughs> rents have dropped since you left. You know, the <laughs> neighborhood's going to hell. I miss you guys. But, uh, but the Luminate acquisition was a big deal for you guys. It really has taken you to a new level. So why don't we, why don't we start there? Take us through sort of the last, well, I guess it's been what, 12 plus months, right? Yeah, so uh, uh, Luminate and ICI actually merged in the uh, beginning of 2013. And uh, it was really, uh, it was the ability for ICI to be able to, to take our messaging nationally. And for Luminate to uh, gain certain technologies and certain uh, skill sets that were actually, I don't want to say missing, but were probably uh, not as strong as what ICI had. So when we actually brought the two organizations together, uh, we now have a very strong virtualization practice, a very strong data center. Um, security is a huge one that Luminate actually brought into the fold so that uh, the, the guys in the Northeast ourselves actually were able to utilize. Um, so really what we actually like to say now is Luminate is really focused on data center, cloud, security, and end user experience. Those tend to be the four major areas that customers work with us on. So, let's uh, unpack those a little bit, because um, you guys, I mean, when you think data center, I mean, I think I, think I remember um, when EMC announced, v, or VCE, I guess they say, announced VBlock, you guys had Our your v own converged yep. infrastructure. Um, you were ahead of the game there. Yep. So converged infrastructure's going on, everybody wants to sort of replicate, duplicate the cloud-like capability uh, in their own data center. I mean, not everybody, but many customers do for, for good reason. So that's one trend that we want to look at. Cloud is, is obviously another one. Security on, on top of everybody's mind. The end user experience is, is what? Like uh, VDI2? I mean, it's, it's, it's basically the next computing. generation of how we're handling the movement of the consumerization of IT. Uh, how enterprises are dealing with delivering not so much a virtual desktop, but delivering the application and the experience that has to go along with the application and usage of data. So it really takes it to a different level than just VDI. So let's start with the data center. Everybody's talking about the software-defined data center. Is, it a, is that a bunch of you know, marketing BS? Is, <laughs> is, it, is, it, is, it, is it real? Is that a sort of yes and yes <laughs> answer? Uh, so, well, the term software-defined data center obviously evolved from VMware. So at some level it is marketing. But what I've come to find is these terms always come to mean something. Just like cloud started out as marketing and mm -hmm. now is something real. Software defined data center, uh, I always termed it as virtualization was the first form of it because it really took the compute and memory and it virtualized that. And now what we're looking at is virtualizing the other aspects of the data center that we really didn't have that type of, as uh, that type of software definition for. So obviously network and storage tend to be the next two most logical pieces of it. So, Brad, what, if, I, if I, just before we get off the data center, Stu, uh, um, the, the everybody talks about the software-defined data center, but nobody talks about the actual data center yep. itself. Can the notion of software-defined and automation go to actually down into the facility, the cooling, the, the power? I mean, Definitely. Are customers thinking about that? Is the industry thinking about that, or is it just sort of an afterthought? So, customers are not thinking about that. Um, I definitely see other uh, manufacturers and vendors starting to head down that road. But I think what's happening is people are still trying to get used to the concept of software-defined data center with the aspects that they understand, meaning storage and networks and stuff. For them to be able to fathom virtualizing all controls and all automation aspects of a facility, I think that is a little bit probably out there for many, many people out in the field right now. So I see that probably as a long-term discussion of truly software-defined data center. It's going to be building blocks of these pieces that we're starting with now. And part of that is organizational too. A lot of times the IT guys and the facility exactly. guys aren't talking. Yeah, so so yeah. Brad, I was wondering if you could unpack a little bit for us, you know, software-defined in the networking and the storage space, you know, where are you and, and your customers at with that these days? Uh, that's a great question. So software-defined storage I see is probably the next leg of what's going to become reality for a majority of people out there. Uh, for the reason simply that software-defined storage, depending on what definition of software-defined storage you use, many people are doing it already. 
right? And there's been uh, data core has been around for a while doing their version of it for many, many years. Um, you know, the fact that VMware has gotten into the game with uh, vSAN, the fact that EMC has Scale.io, all these other features and pieces of it are coming out. But left hand had a VSA years ago, right? NetApp has theirs. There's a, depending on yeah. if you use the definition of virtualizing the software that runs the storage, or is it actually going to be that separation of the control plane from the data plane? And that's really the big, I think, the war that's going to be going on over the next year. Probably 2014 is the big year for that, of what's going to truly win out for the term software defined storage. Is it more of an EMC Viper? Or is it going to be more of a VM or VSAN? And where are we going with that? So I wonder if I could ask you, a, you know, again, I love, this, love having you on because the CTO perspective. This notion of separating the control t plane from the data plane, I'd, I'd never heard customers talk about that yep. un until I heard the EMC Viper announcement. And so I, saw, so I said, okay, what's really behind that? Is that EMC trying to abstract the complexity of its portfolio or does it really truly add customer value and is that a long-term trend? Or, or maybe both, maybe sometimes EMC can lead that trend by trying to solve some of the problems that it created. So help us squint through okay. some of that. So when you start talking about EMC Viper, specifically, because that's one of the leading uh, form of the control plane storage discussion, realistically, EMC is one of the leaders there because they have a product around it. Mm -hmm. But even uh, pieces like OpenStack have modules that do that breakout of, so of storage control into a control plane. Now the problem is, many organizations are not ready for that discussion, right? Many organizations are still trying to wrap their head around what is software-defined storage for me, and do we need to get to the layer of, of separating out control versus the data plane? Now, when you're talking about the enterprise shops, and I like to say usually Fortune 50, maybe Fortune 1000, somewhere up in that range, that's when the organization has enough people and enough talent internally to be able to separate out the control plane and the data plane and actually make a real functioning environment. When you start dropping down into the lower end enterprise and probably a large part of the commercial industry, those organizations don't have the talent on board or even the, uh, the ability right now to implement anything close to an EMC Viper yet. Okay, so there's, there's some complexities in separating the control plane and the data plane. 100%, there is. What are the, let's assume I'm an organization that, that, that can exploit that that, that mental model, what are the benefits of doing that? So the benefits are agnostic automation of your environment. The ability to not have to care what storage array is actually behind it, what vendor I've utilized. I can have EMC storage, I can have virtual like a vSAN, I can have an HP uh, three par in place, and at the same level, whenever I write my automation layer up front, I can have the exact same set of commands and the same set of controls up front no matter who is sitting behind my storage layer. That right there is the true definition of as we move into the cloud, you are going to need that level of separation because cloud is about operationalization and automation. And to be able to get to a standardized operating model and a standardized automation model, you need to have commonality in the back end. So let me make sure I understand this. So historically, the control plane or the data plane has sort of been munged in this box. Yep, inside right? one array. Locked inside yep. the array. And he who sold the array made a ton of cash. Correct. So now if you separate those out, great for customers, that mm -hmm. you can, can, everybody complains about you know, stove pipes, right. but so the, 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 the power in the industry shifts to the guy who can manage that control plane. Yep. Is that right? It's like VMware. I mean, yeah. and I'm going to equate software-defined storage back to software-defined servers. Because when VMware came out with a the hypervisor, they took some of the control capabilities away from the server manufacturers. All of a sudden, you saw Dell and HP and those guys starting to say, oh my God, we're not going to be able to sell as many servers because look at VMware, look what they can do. But realistically, what happened was there was a happy medium that was found in between that the server manufacturers can augment and work with the virtualization layer, even though that virtualization layer didn't make those server manufacturers as unique anymore. And that's what's going to happen in the storage space. You're going to find the storage vendors trying to clamor for the ability to stay unique while also start trying to be the owner of that control plane. And, and the, well, the owner of the control plane, you're saying, will be able to deal with anybody's storage. Yep. So if I have an EMC control plane and an HP control plane and an IBM, M control plane. Well, that's the problem. I'm stovepiping com control planes. Right and that's there. going to be the discussion is, first of all, is the control plane based on standards, industry standards? That's a very big discussion that's going on right now in the back end of all these companies. And second of all, is somebody going to need multiple control planes? Right? Is one control plane going to be enough? Will EMC Viper be enough if they have a mix of storage vendors behind the scenes? 
the answer by a lot of these guys is yes, it will be. Right? And that's what, they're, that's what they're aiming for to deliver through these different models. And that's a good vision. I mean, as a Great technologist, vision. you'd love that, right? Now, and you mentioned OpenStack before. That's in part OpenStack's potential, is it not? That is exactly what OpenStack's potential is. OpenStack is interesting because it's affecting many different areas. And if you think about it, OpenStack has their storage modules. Their network modules tend to actually be not their own. It's not part of the OpenStack as much as the Nicerias of the mm -hmm. world and Cisco and other people have uh, modules that fit in. But OpenStack has like Cypher and some of these other pieces that actually will control the storage. So the real discussion in the software defined storage space is who's going to win out and who's going to work best with OpenStack? Does OpenStack need to have an outside control plane such as an EMC Viper, to truly function properly, or will they have something built in that they can do themselves? And, and the other piece of that is, if I'm um, EMC, do I take my data plane and make it work with the OpenStack control plane? Exactly. And how aggressive am I about that, or do I walk a fine line? And, uh, well, that's know. the, I mean, I, let's take EMC as a good example. They've always done a real good job of walking that fine line yeah. and building their own stuff, so I don't see that affecting them. There are other storage manufacturers out there that are going to have a tougher time in that. Um, and I, I don't want to name names, but I, some of them know what's happening in the industry and are not keeping up with it. Well, but that's a good point. You're right, EMC has always somehow figured it out. Stu used to work there, but, yep. uh, but they, <laughs> and they're not afraid to sort of go after their own businesses, but at the same time, they're not afraid to you know, keep their own businesses humming. So that's true. Yeah. Sort of so organizationally, so they got that model down. Brad, I wonder if we yeah. can take a discussion over to convergence. As we okay. said, you know, you, uh, when you were ICI, you had your own product. You, you've worked with VCE, and now there's even newer converged architectures you mentioned. vSAN w from VMware, and EMC's got the scale IO. Um, you know, can, can you talk, what, what are you seeing out there in uh, you kind of the maturation and adoption of, of converged solutions? So from a converged perspective, there's actually another term we've been using of hyper-converged. Um, and the hyper-converged term has starts to head down the SimpliVity, the Nutanix, sort of these all-in-one boxes that have that extra layer of convergence. Um, the convergence discussion has become really easy to have. First of all, because there are so many proven versions of it out there. Anything from a V-Block to V-Specs to FlexPod and all, all these different versions of it, they've been proven finally. People have bought in their references and, and I think that market is set and that market is going to push forward very quickly. When you get into the hyper-converged market, right, it's basically kind of uh, nipping away at the tail of the converged market because it's extending it to such an extreme that those guys are actually doing really well out there now. And they're getting a lot of mind share in the industry right now because the mentality of converged and even hyper-converged is you don't need to worry about what's behind it. And if you don't need to worry anymore about those underlying layers, the storage layers and the server layers, then all of a sudden you can minimize the impact on operations, you can minimize the impact on upgrade costs, on future build-out costs, and really that's why I do see converged and hyper-converged taking off and being a mainstay for the industry. We had yep. uh, Derry Lee on earlier, Stu, and yep. he, they were looking at doing some, you know, redoing their backup, and they realized that, geez, it's going to be too expensive, they end up bringing in, was it it's Simplivity, I Simplivity. think. Simplivity. And they, they, they did their, their whole converged infrastructure over. They did their whole compute, their whole network, <laughs> their whole storage, and they got their backup. It was yeah, quite yeah. an interesting so, story. So, so, wow. so Brad, actually, we, we, we dropped a report about a week ago, and we said hyperconverged was kind of an interesting term. There's a lot of storage solutions, software solutions out there that kind of answer that. Yep. Uh, what we put forth was what we call a server SAN. Yes. Um, because if you look, we had uh, Brad Anderson on from Microsoft, and storage spaces from Microsoft could fit into this uh, discussion. Exactly. Uh, you know, VMware, and of course, SimpliVity, Nutanix, who just announced a big round, so th there's a lot going on in that space. Um, you, you know, what do you think? Will that just eat away at you know the FlexPods and VCEs of the world? Is it additive, and just this whole converged market will take over the legacy? What, what, what do you so see? So it's funny because it's always a, a eat or be eaten world right now. That no matter what technology you're talking, like oh my god, that's the best thing ever, and it's going to destroy all the rest of the market. And then you wait and you wait and you wait, and everybody can live peacefully and happily and together, and that's what happens. Even inside of, again, you look at like the NetApps of the world and the Hitachis and the EMCs, they all have these different storage arrays that have lived peacefully forever. VNX and VMAX and FAS and, and HDS with VSP and HUS VMs. They all have their place in the market and that's what's going to happen with the Nutanix and SimpliVities versus the VBlocks and the VSpecs is they're all going to find their niche. Right? Now, yes, a Nutanix or a SimpliVity, can they work in larger environments? Definitely. Um, are they going to take over the market? No. They're not, because you're still going to need some level of, of features and functions that these traditional storage arrays have actually given you. So a traditionally converged stack is actually going to be a lot better for some of the larger enterprise to actually put behind them. What about, um, let's talk uh, Amazon. 
for a bit. Yes. They were here um, given the Amazon 101, which a lot of practitioners hadn't heard. I talked to a number of practitioners and said, uh, th th this was all new to me. And um, very powerful messaging. Uh, you're seeing them be very aggressive moving into the enterprise. What are you seeing there? How do they fit into your go-to-market strategy and your portfolio? Are you connecting into Amazon? Are you kind of competing with Amazon? How's that all? It's interesting because Amazon's one of those. For myself, right, we went from a traditional kind of consulting organization into uh, the reseller space many years ago, and we've kind of tried to move forward into that future of our model, which we're trying to still figure out like everybody else. Mm. Um, the cloud has driven us to learn more about all the different offerings out there, and Amazon has obviously been a leader in the cloud space, and I think they're going to continue to be for a very long time. If anything, many of the other cloud providers are catching up to Amazon. Amazon is truly the leader in the space, and they, I think they'll stay that way for a long time for the reason that they're easy to use, they're easy to purchase, um, they have many, many features that a, a traditional set of clouds do not have, and the question really is, what do you need to get out of your cloud? Is it just IaaS? Is it just a virtual machine to run something? Or do you want to actually expand what your organization can do in the cloud and get to the storage as a service, the platform as a service, the big data as a service? Mm. If you want to expand into this larger set of portfolios, if you want that one-stop shop, Amazon today is pretty much the only person you're going to be alluring. able to Very It essentially turned the data center and all the utilities around it into an API. You're right. And, um, and you know, we were at reInvent, and you know, they're announcing things like Kinesis and VDI as a service. I feel as though, I mean, uh, obviously, huge market. I mean, we're talking trillions of dollars in, in, in business. Mm -hmm. And it seems as though the sort of general enterprise market is try still trying to figure out, okay, how do we compete with Amazon? How do we replicate some of those capabilities? Are they figuring it out? Is it coming together, or is there still need to be more work done there? Uh, there's going to be more work done. I mean, that's not ready yet. It, it, Unfortunately, it's going to be as good as the, uh, how do I put this? The industry cannot absorb it all at once at this point because mm. things have been moving so fast for probably the past three to four years. Since the inception of the term cloud, which I think happened around 06. Um, which is, by the way, the year that Amazon announced AWS. Right? Exactly, yeah. and that was when I think Google had kind of you know, termed the coin, uh, coined the term cloud at some level. Amazon took that over and ran with it, and since then, that's really changed how the market has been progressing because all of a sudden it was a deluge of everybody's going to be going cloud by 2010. Oh my God, it's going to take over the market. It's not the year of VDI joke that we always have around VDI, but the year of cloud has been a steady progression towards, okay, we really seriously have to look at cloud. And Amazon has been the beneficiary of that because they were the first to market with it. Um, they have the most robust solution if you're looking for breadth of actual features. And realistically, the cost model is there. Now the problem is organizations have not understood or learned how to control the progress into an Amazon cloud. And that's actually been one of the uh, defensible pieces by other cloud providers is, especially VMware-based ones, that they can help them get to a public cloud model with a little bit less um, impact to the business. Because right now, if you have Amazon, your developers are using them, you don't know if they're using them possibly. They could just be swiping their credit cards off running machines, and, and all of a sudden, where are your apps? Where's your data? Oh, there's a security breach. Okay, we're in trouble. When you're in a VMware shop going to more of a VMware cloud, there tends to be a little bit more of an IT control put in place to move to that cloud. And that's what has to happen in the Amazon space right now, is the IT organizations have to help lead the business to Amazon and not let the business lead IT to Amazon. Well, so is that an opportunity for an integrator like yourself? Exactly. I mean, that's, I mean that's, so you're not, you're not running from, from Amazon, you're no. watching it and 100%. potentially embracing it, right? We're watching it. Amazon's been interesting to partner with. They have not always been the most VAR friendly. They're really not. The most, you know, they, there was never a need to have a consulting organization work with Amazon until the past few years. Yeah, and that's changing, isn't that's it? That's changing yeah. 100%. Because they, they're actually they like, duh, to get into the enterprise. Exactly, they're <laughs> seeing partners. that. And they're, yeah. they're needing the consulting aspect. There are a lot of coding mm. uh, partners, but not integration partners, and they're starting to get there. Yeah, go ahead, Stu. So I was just, uh, you know, what about Microsoft? We had, you know, Brad Anderson on earlier and said everything that they build gets, you know, built out in Azure first and then puts on. So yep. they have a really good story for th that hybrid deployment. So I'm wondering your, your thoughts there and are you guys working with Microsoft? Uh, so it's funny, Microsoft is on my list of 2014 initiatives to work with. Uh, we have been a very traditional VMware partner. Um, to the point that obviously we've worked with every product set, we've picked up the VMware clouds, become a service provider for them at some level, as well as worked with their VCHS offering. And then what we're seeing is Hyper-V kind of sort of is knocking on the door for a lot of SMBs and mid-markets. Upstream, they're not really getting there yet. 
But what is ending up happening is the cloud discussion is happening more and more around Azure now. And because of that, people are forcing us, meaning Luminate, to be able to get into that discussion. Um, what my experience has been is that it is very easy to use, almost as easy as uh, Amazon, not quite there yet. Um, but they've also don't quite have the feature, uh, the feature rich set that Amazon has or the stability and the long history that a VMware type of setup has. Because VMware always did the opposite. VMware started with their internal products and they pushed them out to the cloud, whereas Microsoft's doing the opposite. So they don't support as much yet, which means that a lot of customers won't be able to get into that just yet. Right, and, and while we're on the VMware, you know, strategy. What, do you, what are your thoughts? I mean, is is the, did the VMware get it right this time? The VMware hybrid cloud service. You know, um, what are you seeing? Is uptake there? Is it is it moving? Um, the short answer is: Do I think they got it right? For the most part, yes. Um, there was a lot of disruption in the VMware community when they came out with VCHS, simply because they had so many service providers on their vCloud suite that it was almost like you're kind of killing the industry. What ended up happening though is they actually became friends at some level and VCHS became somewhat of a test bed to allow the service providers to see some of these other features uh, be able to be integrated into VCD. Um, I have not seen VCHS stealing from the other service providers mm -hmm. and we work with the likes of iLand and some of those guys. Um, the other nice thing that VCHS is doing, there is a slow uptick for them, but it's a good slow uptick because they're having things like disaster recovery as a service tied directly into SRM, stuff like that that's going to be coming out. And when you get those types of features, people are really comfortable doing DR as a service right now, more so than infrastructure as a service, to kind of put their foot in the water and see what's going on. Yeah, when we saw the VMware hybrid cloud service come out, we said, okay, this is kind of VMware's stick right. to get the service provider community you know, behind what they're trying to do. And and uh, so I, I think you're right, they haven't been trying to steal business, they're yep. trying to catalyze business. This is how you do it, follow us and we will lead you. But people were afraid it was a little bit of a head fake there for a while. It, it, it uh, was, and it was interesting, but I actually in the past, I would say probably two months, there's been a huge uptick in discussion around VCHS as well as customer buy-in to it. And the cloud credits program from VMware was also a, a nice discussion to have with customers to give them flexibility of which VMware cloud to actually get. All right, Brad, we'll give you the last word. Um, 2014. Put a bumper sticker on what you want to see. If, if we're here in 2015 and you're pulling away from Gillette Stadium at the you know 2015 VTUG, what's the bumper sticker on 2014 going to say? 2014 was probably the year that software-defined data center was truly defined. Excellent. All right, man. Really appreciate you coming on and uh, Thank you. always an awesome discussion and Thank great you, guest. All right, keep it right there, everybody. Stu Miniman and I will be back to wrap up. We're here live. This is SiliconANGLE's The Cube from the VTUG Winter Warmer, live from Gillette Stadium. We'll be right back. <laughs>